Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I like to tell stories. It's kind of what I do. <laughs> so I heard a story about a married couple. The wife was a believer. The husband was not. The Bible kind of talks about this. What do you do in that situation? Well, when you're putting together 1 Corinthians 7 and 1 Peter, I think 3, you put them together and you get this. Look, just win over the spouse to the faith by your example. And so that's exactly what the wife was trying to do. Just being really kind, really nice all the time, good temperament, not angry, full of joy. But here's the thing. There were a lot of other people calling themselves Christians, making it really difficult for her. So that's like the plight of a pastor, right? So you're, <laughs> you're making this difficult for me. So that's what's happening, especially their neighbor. This guy had the Jesus fish on the back of the car, but whenever the kids would like play catch and the ball would accidentally hit it, he would go nuts threatening to sue them. And, you know, the husband's thinking like, wait a minute, you know, I heard all these stories. Jesus is all about sacrifice and really not caring about material things at all. This guy's like the opposite. So it's really difficult. This woman's getting frustrated. So finally, ding, she's like, I'll invite my pastor over for dinner. That'll be great, right? And he can explain this to him and serve as a good example. Yeah, that's what a Christian should be doing. At least he's trying. So that's what happens. Pastor gets to dinner. And he notices an opportunity. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for an in, you know, like, what can I use here with this person who's going to be difficult with me? He sees a piano. And he remembers that the wife had said the husband's a very good piano player and that he's teaching his daughter how to play the piano. And he notices something because he's played a little piano. He notices a little red book on there. If you ever played piano, maybe I'm just old, but whatever. Teaching little fingers how to play, right? So it's that, that initial book that you get when you're learning how to play. But he also see, sees Beethoven on there. And so he says, you know, I love Beethoven. Can you play me some Beethoven? Can you get your daughter to do that, actually. And the husband's like, ooh, that's advanced. That's advanced. She's teaching little, you know... So she can do one of those. You know, here we go up a road to a birthday party. <laughs> so I can still play that, right? So, so you know, do that. That'll be great. No, no, no. I want the Beethoven. You think this pastor is crazy, right? Is this guy even a pastor? So no, no, no. I'm just really, I, I'm just yearning to hear Beethoven. And I just love when the little kids can play it. And he's like, okay, we'll give it a try. Sits the girl down at the bench, takes the other book away. She's like, are you serious? Yeah, give it a try. She starts playing, and she's butchering it. Like, it's just terrible. It's painful. And the pastor just lets it go on and on. And then the dad's about to stop her. He's like, no, 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 no. Wait. Finally, she gets to the end of the piece. And he leans on the piano, <laughs> looks at the girl and says, Beethoven was a horrible composer. Then looks at the dad, and he could see the dad got what he was putting down. You see, just as you shouldn't judge a composer by a player, especially a bad player, you shouldn't judge Christianity by someone who isn't practicing it. <laughs> you got that. All right. <laughs> so... This is going to work into our theme, of course, a little bit. Just to recap, we're going to go back a little bit. Daniel, Daniel, a man of integrity. Will you do the right thing even if it costs you? So we're going to have that theme in mind today. We're going to go a step or two further. And some of you might not like it, but that's okay. So we're going to continue. So first we'll do the chart. Start with the chart. No jokes about the cartoon. I made just the text part, not the cartoon. So here is where... We have these historical books of the Bible, like 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings. We're coming to a close of all that, but there are still things happening that connect to it. All throughout, we saw that prophets weave their way through the account. The Bible's not chronological, so it's a quick review, because I've said this a million times. The Bible is not chronological. You have to kind of take it apart and put it back together again. A lot of times it's based on themes or in the category, what type of books they are. Right? Poetry books, history books. So the, if you want to do it chronological, you've got to 
take it apart, put it back together, and that's what I've done here for you. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to run right into Ezra today, and then we'll pop back in at Daniel. So I'll show this a couple times so you can kind of see where we are. So I want to take you back, and you remember Daniel in the lion's den. Remember that, right? So we're going to kind of go back and forth on that one. A lot of you know that story. We saw that the king Belshazzar, he was kind of bad, or Belshazzar, sorry, said it backwards. I made my own dyslexic mistake there. So we'll go back to the lines then, Daniel 6, 28. So Daniel prospered during the reign of King Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So remember, Darius was the king then, right? So he's so amazed it made a God worshiper out of him. Initially, he's having people worship him, and then Daniel amazes him, the Lord, right? Through Daniel, amazes him, and now he makes a decree. You only worship the God of Daniel. That's it. So that's where we are in this thing. We should keep that in mind. Now, if we pair it together, 2 Chronicles 36, 22. In the first year of King Cyrus, so just mentioned him, of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put his proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what the King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go there for this task, and may the Lord your God be with you. The very next book of the Bible, now it's chronological-ish, just in this spot, is Ezra. We run right into Ezra. And look at this. It's kind of the same thing. We have a recap if we go to Ezra in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia. So the first three verses are basically the same, except the last verse. Four, wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So just keep that up for a second. Don't, don't switch it. So here I just want to make a brief mention. We're going to talk about this more, other books of the Bible, the Bible of the early church. This is where if you're in certain Bibles, you'll run into first and second Esdras. So it's like Greek Ezra. So just, just to put that down and mention that, I'm not skipping it. Uh, it's kind of a mashup of a little bit of Nehemiah, some of Ezra, a couple stories that aren't in there. So we can talk about that at Bible study, just mentioning it. So here we see how this attaches, right? So now we're in Ezra, just the chart again, and I'm going to give you a summary of one through four. It's kind of lengthy uh, in the sense people don't like reading genealogies, but it's important. So remember what we just talked about. We talked about like, hey, give them the things they need. Give them the supplies they need to go back. What's going on? Remember that they were in exile. You were in exile, 70 years. Now the Lord is using King Cyrus to send them back. But he's sending them back with a lot of stuff. So you're going to see, remember the writing on the wall, right? We had that, that thing there. What was the problem? Why was that king judged? Well, because he's using the temple items. He's using the items stolen from the temple. Like, so just imagine like if we're in a really traditional church and maybe we're doing you know, communion with a chalice or something, right? So it would be like you know, taking that chalice home and like you know, pouring a 40 into it you know, and being like, woo! You know, so it's really irreverent. It's not good. You can laugh. It's okay. Yeah, a pastor just said that. <laughs> I haven't always been a pastor, so that, that will become very obvious. Um, so anyway, so they're taking these objects, and they're just, it's terrible, right? So they're being very irreverent, and God is punishing him, right? Mine, mine, tikal, imparson, right? Numbered, weighed, divided. You're done. He dies. And that's how we get Darius. So there are all these items, and they're like, you know what? Go back, build your temple again in Jerusalem, and here's about 5,400 items that you're going to take with you. It's a lot of stuff. So then, chapter 2, there's a list of all the people, about 50,000 people. There are not 50,000 people listed, but it feels that way. It's a big, long genealogy, basically the heads of the families, all the people going back. So these historical records, they're really, really detailed in the Bible, and it can get long. So we're not going to read all those things to you. So then you see the rebuilding of the altar. So they get there. Remember, the temple's been destroyed, so they got to rebuild it. That's the first thing they want to do. They rebuild the altar, not completely, but they just set up an altar, and they worship God. That's the first thing they do. Then they get to work on what? If you've built a building, the foundation. And when they finish building it, the younger people are all like, whoa, yay, they're really excited. But the older people, 
the Jeremiah 29, 11 people, right? <laughs> that, that, the, the people that this scripture actually applies to. <laughs> they're old. There are very few of them. They're old. They come back, but they remember the temple, right? So they're probably thinking of how it was destroyed, all this stuff, and they start weeping. And so it's like, if you know the word, like a, a dissonance, a cacophony, a just hard word, harder word, of like all this weird mix <laughs> of this, this worship or praise and this sorrow. So it's a really interesting sound that comes out of this. Now we get to Ezra 4. Here's what we're going to see. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were rebuilding a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. So they approached Zerubbabel and the other leaders and said, let us build with you. Pay attention, for we worship your God. Who is God? Just as you do. We have sacrificed to him ever since King Esarhaddon of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the other leaders of Israel replied, You may have no part in this work. We alone will build the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. Then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. This went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until King Darius of Persia took the throne. So there are more than one Dariuses and more than one Cyruses. So uh, just keep that in mind. That's why it gets really confusing that that's what's going on. So we're building into our theme now of these people acting deceitfully. What? So yeah, you know, we want to worship your God. You know, they're letting it slip there, I think. Right? So uh-uh, they're not genuine. And now they're using deceit, right, to try to undermine the plans of the building of the temple. It brings us back to the chart and why we're going to Daniel here. So pay attention. Daniel 10.1. In the third year of the reign of who? King Cyrus of Persia. So that's why you dropped that in there. Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar. That's where I even dyslexed myself. <laughs> Belshazzar is the other king. Daniel's na other name is Belshazzar. Had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future. Times of war and great hardship. When this vision came to an end, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three whole weeks. At that time, I had eaten no rich food. No meat or wine crossed my lips. And I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. So I'll give you a summary here um, of chapters 10 through 11. And then we'll hop into 12. It can get really confusing if you don't understand the rest of the Bible. There are many similarities here to chapter 7, 8, 9. These visions, remember where the goat rammed the ram? And then I had a hard time expressing that because the goat is doing the ramming of the ram. So anyway, that's what happened. So you're looking at different kingdoms. And they're just the, these things symbolize the different kingdoms and different kings, like the horn, and then it breaks off and that kind of thing. So a heavenly visitor comes. It's probably Gabriel, and he gives Daniel this sweeping vision of history, like nearer to them history. And so basically from the Persian Empire all the way to Antiochus, the one of the smaller little horns. And historically, I'll just keep this short. What happens is after Alexander the Great dies, four generals come into play. The main ones that are talked about if you read these books like Maccabees in the Bible, it's a historical account of this. You have Ptolemies. Right, and so think Egypt and then Seleucid, and just think like Syria area or over there by Turkey and whatever, maybe not that far north. But they're going at it with one another now. So the Jewish people are in the middle of this. So this is what is going on here. That's who they're talking about, Antiochus and this time where they're, they're kind of going at it. Uh, what you'll read in there, too, it's kind of strange. It might say spirit princes or spirit messengers, and then Michael the archangel shows up. And the point of all of that, is to remind us that our battle isn't against flesh and blood, right? So people are used, like I think Judas, right? Satan entered into Judas, right? So there's a spiritual battle going on behind all of these things. Doesn't mean that, you know, like the spirit made me do it, right? Or the devil made me do it. No, it doesn't excuse us from any type of responsibility. However, it's a reminder that even in these kingdoms, there are like these archangels behind it waging a spiritual war. That's where the battle is won or lost. So that's what's going on here in this text, which brings us to the end times. And we talked about this in prophecies, right? So you'll get these prophecies that are really confusing if you don't read them carefully because they're talking about a near future 
And that already happened, but then they'll kind of zoom out to a far future. So that's what's going on here. It does it all over the place. So here we're talking about the end time. Daniel 12.1. At that time, Michael the archangel who stands guard over your nation will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end when many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. So you see, clearly, that is the end time. And now, look at that. When they're talking about a resurrection from the dead. Pretty neat. So there's a discussion now. How long will these things happen? Daniel's confused. When will this time finally come? And then he's encouraged. And what's said here is, go now, Daniel, for what I've said is kept secret and sealed to the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined by these trials, but the wicked will continue in their wickedness, right? So people are going to choose their own past. They talk about that sacrilegious object that causes desecration. People get confused. Jesus talks about this. There are two different times when this could have happened here. Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, and they set up a sacrilegious object, right, in the temple. Antiochus did the same thing, set up the religious object, but way before. So that's talked about but as for you, Daniel, go your way until the end. You will rest, and at the end of your days, you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. So as the book of Daniel comes to a close here, I want to mention something that we've talked about in our series, and it'll play right into this theme today. It's kind of interesting how that always seems to work, themes. We've talked about it in the past, and it really took me a while because just to give you a little background, I was raised Catholic, and I don't know about other Catholic churches. We didn't read a Bible. I didn't have a Bible in my house. I didn't know anything about the Bible, really, except what the priest preached to me on Sunday. So I don't know what that's about. But if generally you go into a Catholic church, you usually see a lot of, like, the hymnals, but sometimes Bibles are not there. Uh, in my church, that's the way it was. So then when I came to Christ, I explored so many other worldviews. It's unbelievable. I was, I'm not even joking, I was a Satanist at one point. Uh, you know, at one point I was a Taoist or whatever. You know, I just changed it every, whatever I thought was cool, I did it, right? But then I came to Christ and I entered into a non-denominational church that wasn't really non-denominational because most, well, they're not. They're, it was Protestant. And so anything like Catholic would set you on fire. You know what I mean? Like you told the Pope is the Antichrist. There's this really anti-Catholic sentiment, which is just was really not right. It, it's not. You don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. They're Christians. So anyway, you're not encouraged to look at anything else. Like if you look at any other denomination, you will burn up. Like that's the attitude, right? You're dead, right? Nobody else except your denomination is a Christian. It's horrible. It's like Paul's worst nightmare. Whereas we all know the gospel is the center of it. And if this person wants to go eat meat sacrificed to idols, that's what Paul's saying, let him. It doesn't make him not a Christian, right? So just the long short of it. So now I get to this point where, especially Protestants, they have to realize, they have to, you have to look. I looked at what's called like textual history, like what the Bible was like in the very beginning, right? And then work my way from there. And here's where my mind went like this. I didn't have to go more than about 150 years back to realize there are several extra books in the Old Testament, even in a 1611 King James Bible. So your great-great-granddaddy's King James Bible had extra books in it, and it literally blew my mind. And when you look at the Bible of the early church, yeah, up to 14 extra books consistently in their Bibles. We look at the oldest copy of the Christian Bible we have, they're all in there. With no apologies or extra, like, these are the apocryphal. <laughs> this doesn't even say that. So here, when we look at Daniel, if you study Christian texts like I do and the real Bible of the early church, again, what the apostles are reading, they're, they're fine with it. It's all good. You're going to get a different Daniel. And it's really funny. It blows people's mind. Even in the Orthodox Bible, they put it in different spots. It's really interesting. So the way the Orthodox Church does it is uh, it starts with Susanna. I, I'm just going to say, I could be wrong. But it starts with Susanna, yes, and then it goes through Daniel. So it's like the, a prelude. And then you're going to get uh, just a longer Daniel, 
It's just Daniel with extra verses. And, oh, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the Orthodox Study Bible has a mistake in it. So I'm going to be re- emailing them. Because when I was doing this, I looked at it. And at the end, it doesn't say Daniel 12. It says Daniel 21. And I was like, what? You know what I mean? I'm, like, trying to separate the pages. There no, I'm like, oh, they made a mistake. So I'm going to email them. I'll share it with you. So see what kind of response. <laughs> yep. So anyway... Uh, so it's a different Daniel. It just looks different. Now, I'm going to go through these accounts with you because it's fun. Um, but if you look in certain Bibles, it's, uh, there's four, 14 chapters in Daniel. So it's Daniel 13 is Susanna, and Daniel 14 is this weird story, Bell and the Dragon. But let me share them with you. And if you have read these stories, if you know about these stories, I'm not going to get every detail, and it's not going to be totally precise. I just want you guys to get the point, right? So these books are in there. If you want more on this, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Uh, a friendly way is not a pro- apocryphal saying this. It's deuterocanonical. It's fun to say. Deuterocanonical. That's what they are. They're second to Scripture. And that's even the way, I don't know about the Orthodox Church, but I think a Catholic priest would tell you that. These are deuterocanonical. They're not on the same playing field. But we've looked at Maccabees, right? And I showed you why it was really important to read that to understand Daniel. You really can't understand Daniel. Everything I'm telling you about Antiochus, that's all coming from those books. <laughs> because the writers of the New Testament, especially, would be all be aware of these books, right? So they have them in the, their minds, right? So they may or may not be scripture, but like other books, you should read them, right? So <laughs> here's the thing. We'll look at Bell and the Dragon first, even though it's, it's backwards. And it's really, to be honest, it's kind of an unusual tale. So again, I'm going to display this. Uh, Bell and the Dragon, that's a 1611 King James Bible. It's mine. Show and tell. So, <laughs> so it's in there. It's right there. And so it's actually the, the history, that's an S, the history <laughs> of the destruction of Bell. All right? So what is that? Bell is an idol that they have, like a, the Babylonians, they're saying, they have this idol up in the temple. And so they're in, like, exile, the Jewish people. And <clears throat> there's this, the Babylonians are worshiping this idol, this fake idol. And so the king, I think Cyrus in this account, is like, Daniel, don't you worship this? And Daniel's like, no, it's not a real god. It's made out of bronze and has clay in the inside. It's not real. And so there's like a little bit of a back and forth in there. And he's insulted. He's mad. He kind of laughs at him. Daniel laughs at the king like, this is stupid, basically, he's saying. And he says, all right. That's fine. You know what? Prove to me that it's not real because here's what's going on. They're bringing massive amounts, like I don't think it's like 40 sheep a day, like massive amounts of stuff, you know, water, all this stuff. So there's like 70 priests and they're all bringing it in and they're leaving it around this fake idol. And then when they go away, the king comes back. It's all gone. And so he's like, it must be eating it. (laughs) You know, so Daniel's like, fine. So there's this like little contest. Basically, look, Daniel, you prove to me that it's not real, or die. And then brings the priest in, says the same thing to the priests. So they're going to seal the door. So familiar with seals and things. But what Daniel does, he has some servants come in, and he scatters, like it says ashes, some accounts, all over the floor. Let's the king seal it up, because he knows what's going on. The priests are coming in through a trap door at night and then leaving. So they're, they're taking all the food or eating all the food. So, so Daniel knows what's going to happen. So they get to the place. And then the king goes, ha ha, see all the food's gone. Daniel's like, stop, whose footprints are these? And the king realizes it and has all these priests and their families killed. So, and then allows Daniel to destroy this temple, the, the idol, all the stuff. So then the king says, well, okay, fine. But this dragon, and the Greek says dragon literally, but think like Komodo dragon or maybe alligator, I don't know, something like that. This is clearly alive. And Daniel's like, So that's a god, right? (laughs) So he's like, listen, king, allow me to kill the dragon without using a sword. So (laughs) Daniel makes a concoction. It's like there are three ingredients. I'm going to leave one out like MacGyver so you guys don't try this at home. So (laughs) if you know, okay, so a lot of old people here. MacGyver, is he still a thing? I don't know. But anyway... (laughs) Uh, he makes this, these cakes out of tar and hair and then something else. And then when it feeds it to the dragon, and it makes the dragon explode. <laughs> it's weird. What? I know. So anyway, like, so that's why I leave out the other ingredient because some of you are going to try to make a cat explode or something like that. We cannot have that. So hey, look, it happens. So, <laughs> so now it makes the dragon explode. But now <laughs> all the people are angry. 
and they get angry at the king. Like, they're going to de- I'm going to dethrone you. We're going to take over, right? You know, first you let this Daniel guy tear down our temple and our statue. Now he makes the dragon explode, and the king's forced into a position where he has to give up Daniel. He does, and it's essentially the lion's den part two except it has a couple other interesting features. There are seven lions in there, and they feed them two dead bodies and two sheep every day to appease them, but they stop doing it. They're going to make sure that this lion is real hungry for Daniel. And so they stop feeding them. They throw him in there. He's in there for six days. Something else weird happens. The prophet Habakkuk is all of a sudden in Judea, and an angel comes to him. He's like, Habakkuk, you got to go see Daniel in Babylon, the lion's den. He's like, I've never been to Babylon. And here's the other problem is that Habakkuk has been dead for like 100 years now. So why is this happening? It doesn't make sense. But then all of a sudden, an angel picks him up from the hair. He was about to deliver stew to the workers in the field. I don't know. And he picks him up by the hair, and he takes him above the lion's den so that he can feed Daniel. Daniel praises God. He's saved. The king shows up on the seventh day to mourn for Daniel, but he sees Daniel in there. He praises God and, like there's, has all the other people who tried to accuse him killed. And that is Bell and the dragon. Now, here's the thing, though. I started thinking, when I first read this, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is really weird. But, but think about it for a second. We've, like Habakkuk, how did he get there? I don't know. We see people rise from the dead all the time in the Bible. It kind of talks about that. Could have been that, right? So just, just bear with me for a second. You can make some good arguments for this if you match it with the rest of the text. You know the story about Saul in the medium? He conjures up Samuel from the dead and has a conversation with him. That happened, right? And everyone's like, yeah, of course. That's good. Ezekiel? He was whisked up by the head of the hair and taken away against his will. What about Philip? In the, that's just Old Testament. Well, Philip in the New Testament. Some pretty weird things happen. Now, I'll give the other side of the aisle. Exploding dragons? Weird. Okay. So, anyway, <laughs> has some similarities. So, again, probably due to, not, it's not scripture, but it was written to teach us something about Daniel. The theme. The deceit. The deceitful priests and things. So it's building into these parts here. Susanna. Susanna is actually rightly a beloved story among a lot of people. I'll just tell it very quickly. And so it can be confusing. The problem with some of these books is they really should be all based on the Greek uh, because that's the original. The Greek is the original. That's it. These were all originally written in the Christian church. It was a Greek Old Testament that they were using, not a New Testament. So it all needs to come from that to get it right. Otherwise, you're using something like the Latin Vulgate, which is like a translation of a translation. It's it's not as good. So it gets confusing, but there's this guy, and some versions will say Jehoiakim, and it gets really confusing because is that the king? No. Joachim is probably a better translation of his name. So remember, we don't all have the same, like, sounds in our alphabets when you go from language to language. So you've got to kind of make the best of it in your language. That's what's going on here. And you have Susanna. She's married to him. He's really wealthy. So wealthy that he has a garden and they're holding court in his house. So you think, maybe think like he has like this thing that looks like a palace, like a really nice place. Susanna's wife, she's really beautiful. Her dad's name is Hilkiah, I think it is. And not the same one, if you know the Bible, that uh, you might be thinking of. So enter in two elders or judges. And so remember, they're like out in exile or whatever. <clears throat> and so they appoint judges out there to rule over their own Jewish affairs, their own rules. But the problem with the elders are they're wicked. They start lusting after Susanna. She's really beautiful, and they see her in the garden. It gives you this, like this uh, Proverbs kind of look, like as I looked through the lattice, you know, I saw this foolish man. So t- similar type of thing going on here. And so They both decide, you know, they're going to have their way with her or they're going to obsess over her for a while. So they go their separate ways and they decide, they both decide separately they're going to go back to the garden and kind of spy on Susanna. And they're like, what are you doing back here? You know, they both make their stories up, but then eventually they confess to one another. And this leads to them concocting a plan to have their way with her. And so one day, it's really hot, she decides in this garden to take a bath and tells her servants, go away. Get me some, like, perfume and bathing oil and lock the doors. Right? So she thinks she's locked in there, but the elders, what they've done is they've snuck in the garden and kind of hidden there and waited for all this to happen. Then they spring out, and they say, let us have our way with you, or we'll tell everybody that we saw you sleeping with another man. So in, that, in the law of Moses, that would get her stoned to death. She would get killed. And so she's like, no, you know, I won't 
do this unrighteous thing. I'd rather, you know, fall into your hands, meaning like let you judge me and get me killed than sin against the Lord. I'm not going to partake in this. So she screams. And now, you know, one of them bolts, opens the door up. The servants come in. They make their accusation. Uh-oh. So now there's like a trial scene going on, like at her house. And these elders are going to pronounce judgment over her. She comes in, and she has a veil on. Her family is there with her. It even says her children are there with her. She walks in, and the accusers are there. And they want to make sure everyone knows she's beautiful, right? So they pull up the veil. And it's kind of a scene like Stephen you get. It reminds me of that, where she's crying. She's looking up to heaven. That's what's going on here. And they place their hands on her head, pronounce the judgment against her. And she's crying out for help. And this is where... The Lord stirs up Daniel. And so Daniel comes in. So everyone believes the elders in the meantime, of course, right? So, so they're the judges anyway. And so they're taking her out to kill her, and she cries out to help for help. Daniel comes in. He says, fools, you, know, you foolish people. How dare you, you know, proclaim her innocent. You didn't even, like, examine everybody right. You didn't do this right. Bring them back in. I want to speak to these elders, these judges, one person at a time. I'm going to cross-examine them. So. He does, and he kind of gives the same type of speech to each one of them. You know, angels ready to cut you in half. You're a liar, even before he asks them any questions. He's, he's saying this because he knows, or God has told him the truth. You're liars. So here's his thing. What kind of tree were they under? And some versions will say, like, a gum tree. I saw them under a gum tree. Like, basically just think a smaller tree. You're a liar. You know, God has already judged you for this. Bring the other one in separately. Does the whole thing again. What kind of tree did you see them under? And he's like, an oak tree, a different tree. And that's it. He's like, see? And he proves to everyone that they're liars. And then, according to the law of Moses, they get the punishment that they wanted to give to this woman. And so you're getting a theme here. And this theme, so on one side of it, and we talked about this, right, the virtue of Daniel. So we can look at the virtue of Susanna. So you see one side of the coin. All throughout, there's another side of the coin in all these accounts, whether it be in Ezra. And so you have this thing where the people, they're deceitful. They're saying, oh, yeah, well, we worship that God too. Right. You know, then they're going around, they're trying to deceive people and acting like this on the back end, like liars. So you see it also, again, Susanna. You see it there. These deceitful elders are trying to come up with this plan, deceive everyone. Bell and the dragon, same type of theme here on the other side. If you have Daniel's virtue, right? It's a risky move. He's going to get killed if he can't prove wrong. But on the other side of it, what happens? You know, these deceitful people. Here's the theme. It all falls back on them. It all falls back on them. So that's what we have to pay attention to. We see here that when people set out to deceive others, they're only fooling themselves. That's it. And still today, and it just amazes me how many people who identify as Christians, you know, who go out with the Jesus fish on the car, all that other stuff, right? They live their lives in a way where they're acting deceitfully. They're trying to make people think they're somebody that they're really not. But again and again, when we look at them, they're only fooling themselves or making fools of themselves in reality. They're not living with this type of integrity. And the other thing that is disturbing to me is they will think, it's no big deal. That's okay. Here's the thing. I would be negligent negligent as a pastor, negligent as a teacher, if I didn't say these words, Jesus says it's a really big deal, a really big deal. And I'm going to show you some scriptures. It's not just Gene saying, it. I'm not trying to knock on anybody. I just, I'm here to preach the truth. And so as we look at these accounts, right, and if you've heard the story of Susanna, you, know, you think, oh, Susanna's righteous, that's great, you know what I mean? But you don't think the other side of the coin there. And those characters are developed in the story for a reason. You know, so we're given like a good, bad example. Careful with that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what are the problems? First, like the illustration this morning, you make for a bad witness if you're doing that. 
you know, that it is frustrating, guys, just to like, you know, I'm not going to complain too much today. But as a pastor, that, that's what I'm trying, that's the crux of the whole thing. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I do. So I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, it's my first priority, and I'm honoring the Word of God and trying to teach you guys from the Bible accurately and intelligently. Got to be in the Word a lot, got to pray. But whatever I do, if I go do something for someone, if I visit someone in the house, whatever it is that a pastor does, it's all for the gospel. Like everything. That's it. All right, so that's the center, and I'm just trying so hard. I'm trying to get everybody to Jesus, come to Jesus, and then I have like 10 other people making Christianity look terrible, or like a country club that they don't want to be a part of, and so it can be really frustrating. It's a really frustrating thing for a pastor, you know, and the answer isn't to take the Jesus fish off the car, because that's already a proclamation that you're going to do something wrong. It doesn't make sense. No, keep it on there and change. So that's the first part. You can chase a lot of people away from the faith. But let's get our train of thought in line here with the passages that we're doing. So I want to take you back to Daniel. You'll, you'll get what I'm building on in a sec. So we see many trials before Jesus comes back. That is the correct Christian way to th see things. It's not going to be all fun and games. We go through trials so over and over and over again, whether it's Daniel, whether it's Revelation, whether it's Jesus warning us, Paul. They're all saying the same thing. So... Daniel 12, 10, the trials here. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined by what? These trials, right? But the wicked, so you see the difference? Who's getting refined? Me, <laughs> Christians, right? You. We're getting refined by these trials. But the wicked will continue in their wickedness, and none of them will understand. Only those who are wise will know what it means. And then we see that object of desecration again. That's in there. Then, Daniel 12, 13, as for you, go your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. Well done, good and faithful slave. You're going to come up, and then there's going to be the resurrection. So now I'm going to kind of go back, and we're going to move in this train of thought. Daniel 12, 1, we'll look at it again. At that time, Michael, the archangel who stands guard over your nation, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since the nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like stars forever. Last week, I paired Daniel and Revelation for you. Let's go back and do it again, and then I will show you on our application what we will see. Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great, so at the time of the end, I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it, the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence. They found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. We. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm not going to go through all the different scriptures, but they're there. I'll point you to a few places if you're somebody who likes to take notes. I'll make a statement, but all of these scriptures back it up. All, everybody, Christians will be judged we will be judged. The Word of God says that extremely clearly. Romans 14, 2 Corinthians 5. If you want to look at it for yourself, 1 Peter 4, verse 17. And if judgment begins with us, right, how will the ungodly be saved? So just remember that. And in Revelation, this is the way it ends here. And so many people, it's just, well, <laughs> don't even get me started. Well, <laughs> Revelation, I'll keep, I'll just read the word of God for you. Revelation 20, so if you want those scriptures, I'll be more than happy to give them to you, read them to you, whatever you want. Revelation 21, 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. I, and I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow, or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And he said to me, it's John, 
<clears throat> Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious, remember from the beginning of Revelation, will inherit all these blessings. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, and all who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, wow, those are all really bad things, Pastor Gene. I couldn't be any one of them, and all liars. Yep, and you know what? I can read the Greek. That's what it says. It's not just the verse. Because every time I do this, I get somebody coming up to me going, what version was that? The version I checked out and made sure was right. That, that's the version. Their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Say, what? When I heard that, <laughs> read that for the first time, I was like, stop. It's worth thinking about. All liars. Liars, the deceivers are not getting in. That's what it says, not me. Now listen, it must be really important because it says it two more times. At least, look, Revelation 21, 27. Nothing, nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry, and now it's getting narrowed down, and dishonesty. Not getting in, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation 22, 12. Look, I'm coming soon. Bring my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are dogs, sorcerers, those who, uh, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. Better translation, all who live a lie. All who are living in deceit. Not in there. Now, here's the thing. Hard to reconcile, but here's why. <laughs> I'll give you a key. I hope you've been here for a while. Know the key. It's easy to reconcile when you read the whole thing. So 1 John. And somebody's actually made the big mistake of throwing this back at me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, boy, this is too easy. 1 John, it ends, right? So if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. This is what the average person does. Great. Wait, hold on. Have sin. Right? We have a sinful nature. We're human beings. We'll have sin. It doesn't say, <laughs> if we say we don't go around sinning all the time, we're liars. Well, maybe, but that's not what it says. Very first line of 1 John 2 is, I write this to you so that you do not sin. Chapter 3 gets worse. Those who make a practice of sinning, are children of the devil. They belong to the devil, not God. Please read it for yourself. Please read it for yourself. But then we get to, we go further, right? And we get to Revelation, and what does it say? And liars is coming up three times. It's crazy. So there are many, many people saying they are Christians, but what the Word of God essentially says is, what you do says more about what you believe than anything you could possibly say. Here's the thing. I want to make this very, very clear. We are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Did you hear that? But read Ephesians 2, 8. See, I've read all this. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8, keep reading. Why? Well, we are, Christ, we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. There's a reason. Right? So the idea here is that we know we're saved by grace, and that should compel us right, to deliver more and more and more and more of that grace by helping people out, loving people. That's the point. It's the other side of the coin. Very important. Now, here's the thing. For those who are working in the light, a lot of these things come as a comfort. So, you know, if you're thinking about it, these are persecuted Christians. John is writing this. He's encouraging them, right? For those of you who are being wronged, this comes as a comfort. It really does, right? So we don't need to take revenge. We look forward to a place where there will be no more people accusing us. There will be 
No liars or deceivers around. And so it sounds great. It's like, that's really cool. There'll be no more suffering and pain. The thorn in our side will be removed. Right? But when I started taking some self-inventory, and instead of doing this all the time, put up a mirror in front of myself, I saw the other things in there. I saw the other side of that. Uh-oh, do I lie? Because it doesn't say. Unless, but the white liars, now, you know what I'm saying. Like the, Those who tell white lies, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble today. <laughs> no one to stop. And start again. Okay, you can cut that. <laughs> so anyway, the, the one, but it doesn't say, right? Like, but, you, you know, the little lies, you know, the little ones are okay. It just doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. And so it scared me. I was like, ooh, I got to get right. So it comes as a comfort. Now, this is a crazy thing. As I close, I just want to share something with you. It's not even in my notes because it couldn't be. It happened this morning. Every day I wake up and I try to get to the Word of God first, like, because... Y'all are crazy. But anyway, so I try to get, I try to, <laughs> I try to get there first. And I'm like, just no, 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 stop. Like, I, I do a psalm. And you guys know I do a proverb, right? And so then maybe I pray. And then I pray again. You know, <laughs> and pray again. And then I start, like, you know, texting people the proverb, my thoughts, and praying for people, right? So this morning, same process, especially on a Sunday. I'm about to preach the word of God. Got to get in there first and just stop, right? So this is, you know the topic, right? Psalm 120 was on the list, so it's just a different psalm every day. But this was on, the, in other words, I didn't open my Bible. This was the assigned psalm, and it's been assigned all month. I have my reading plan for the month that I'm going to do. It's, it was in there. Check this out. This is what came up today. Psalm 120. <clears throat> I took my troubles to the Lord. I cried out to him, and he answered my prayer. Rescue me, O Lord, from liars and from all deceitful people. It was the first thing I read. I was like, okay, you're supposed to preach that. Again, it's a comfort. The truth will be revealed. You want to know what the other verses are? <laughs> oh, deceptive tongue, what will God do to you? How will he increase your punishment? You will be pierced with sharp arrows and burned with glowing coals. That's the other side of it. You can't fool God. So those who live a lie will find out, whether it's now or in the end, that they've only been fooling themselves. That's it. So that is why when Paul's writing to the church in Rome, he echoes what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that we looked at last week and says this. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace. Peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. So it is my prayer that those who are suffering persecution, lies, slander, deceit, be encouraged. Be encouraged. No matter what happens to you in a human court, right, you are right before God and his. You're good. Just keep doing what you're doing. That's it. And to those who are fooling themselves, as commanded in Scripture, I pray for them. I pray for them. Mercy is in my heart towards those people because I know what the word of God says is going to happen to them. So I pray the Lord blesses them with, with the knowledge that they walk in the light. And just if, if that is for anyone, we have a lot of people watch online, anyone who's not walking in the light with Christ, listen, I'm really praying for you. But I'm going to give you some encouragement, too, if that's you. I don't know who it is. I have no one in mind. I'm going to give some encouragement to you as I close. In, in the light, at first it seems hard, like anything else, when we're trying to get it right. And I'm not perfect. No, I never said that. I do things wrong. It's just that I'm in the light, so it gets exposed quickly. 
And it's like, okay, I, I got to change that, whether I realize the Holy Spirit tells me or my wife. <laughs> so, right, a lot. So it's okay, right? But, but I allow myself to be exposed. I have accountability. So I'm not perfect. I sin. Don't hear like, I don't sin. Never said that. But, Lord, take it from me. I don't want it. And that's what Christ does to us when we have him in our hearts. We won't want it anymore. I don't want to sin. When it comes up, I'm like, I, I just, I hate it. So those are just, you're in the hamster wheel. If that's you, you're hearing this now. Here's the thing. In the light, there's no more regret. In the light, there's no more shame. If you're living with that burden, you don't need that anymore. In the light, there are none of, they don't exist. No regret, no deceit, no shame, no more sorrow, no more thinking over and over, oh, man. No more of that self-hate and frustration, just the love of Christ, the joy, peace, love, kindness that comes in him. So I just invite you into that today. We pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, this time, these people, their willingness to come and hear your word. No matter what else is going on in the outside of the world, they just made this a priority. They've made you a priority, and that's just the first step. So if someone's tuning in, if they're here, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for taking that first step. And just be encouraged. Come on in and take the next steps that you need to take to come into the peace and joy that is only found in Jesus Christ. I ask these things in Jesus' name.